Welcome to Unit 4's first topic, 4.1, Plate Tectonics. The Earth is old. How old? Give or take 40 or 50 million years, it's approximately 4.54 billion years old. While time on scales like that can be difficult to comprehend, the geologic processes occurring on Earth throughout its history influence so many things. Evidence suggests that, as early as 4 billion years ago, early land masses began to form as the Earth's surface cooled. Due to convection beneath the planet's surface, sections of the Earth's crust began to shift and move around. This action, still occurring today, results in the formation and destruction of geologic features like mountain ranges and valleys, and are also responsible for other geologic phenomena like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Along with physical processes like conduction and radiation, convection is the transfer of heat due to the movement of molecules in a fluid. In physics parlance, fluids include gases and liquids. When a fluid is heated, molecules within it begin to move around more quickly and collide into one another more often. Because of this, those molecules begin to move farther apart, expanding and becoming less dense. The portion of the fluid that now has a lower density than the rest begins to rise. Rising and moving away from the heat source results in a reversal of the process. Cooling, contracting, increasing density the fluid sinks back down to occupy the space being left by the warming, rising portion of the fluid. This cycle of heating and rising, coupled with cooling and sinking, is referred to as a convective current. Convective currents are responsible for how the atmosphere behaves, influences deep ocean currents, as well as the liquid magma beneath the Earth's surface. The Earth's structure can be considered from a few perspectives. We're going to look at two of them in particular, starting with Earth's compositional layers. Starting with the outermost layer is the lithosphere. The lithosphere includes the solid outer crust, some of which is continental and some is oceanic, as well as the solid top layer of the mantle. Below the solid top portion of the mantle is a region of the mantle called the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere is not quite solid, but doesn't flow like a typical fluid because of its extremely high viscosity, and therefore flows at a velocity of only a few centimeters per year. Traveling deeper into the mantle, the material becomes less viscous due to growing heat and pressure. The Earth's core is comprised of a solid inner portion and a liquid outer layer. Viewing the structure of the Earth from a mechanical perspective allows us to observe the processes that are taking place in each region. Most importantly for plate tectonics is what's occurring in the mesosphere, part of the mantle, the asthenosphere, and the lithosphere. Because of the convective currents in the Earth's mantle and asthenosphere, the solid lithospheric plates float on top of those two layers. The mantle material, although in liquid form, is still quite viscous, so it doesn't flow particularly fast. Those slow convective currents, heated by the Earth's core, can take millions of years to complete. This results in the very slow yet steady movements of the Earth's tectonic plates. Some tectonic plates possess land masses which, thanks to this process, are always moving. There are many dozens of tectonic plates, but only 10 to 15 are considered by most geologists to be major ones. This map illustrates the puzzle-like nature of those major tectonic plates. A huge portion of the Pacific Ocean rests on top of the Pacific Plate. Nearly all of Europe and Asia are on the Eurasian plate. The North American and South American plates have sandwiched in between them the Caribbean plate. Unlike the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean straddles a number of plates. And because of where we live, the relatively small Juan de Fuca plate, just off the west coast of the Pacific Northwest, 
hold special significance. Those plates that have large volumes of water sitting on top of them, such as the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, have denser crust than continental plates do. The reason for this is because of the massive pressure being exerted on those oceanic plates, compressing the crust, resulting in higher crustal density. The varying densities of oceanic and continental crust influences how plates interact with each other where they meet at plate boundaries. Plate boundaries are the areas where two tectonic plates meet. They can be hundreds or thousands of kilometers long. There are three basic categories of plate boundaries. First is a convergent boundary. A convergent boundary is where two plates are coming together. Some examples of locations where plate boundaries like this can be found are where the South American plate meets with the Nazca plate off of its west coast. The Juan de Fuca plate is converging with the North American plate off of its northwest coast. And the Philippine plate is converging with the Eurasian plate in the South China Sea. A divergent boundary is where two plates are separating from one another. Perhaps the most famous example of a divergent boundary is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that snakes its way along the Atlantic Ocean sea floor, traveling from north to south. Another example of a divergent boundary can be seen in the eastern portion of Africa. Not shown in this map is a much smaller tectonic plate in that region of Africa called the Somalian Plate, which is diverging from the rest of Africa's Nubian Plate. Lastly, a transform boundary is one in which the two plates are sliding past one another laterally. A prime and famous example of this is between a region of the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. What kinds of geologic features and processes are found or occurring at a plate boundary are dependent upon two main factors, the type of boundary and the type of plate, either oceanic or continental. At an ocean-ocean convergent boundary, because both plates have relatively equal density, when they collide into one another, both plates begin to fold under and dive toward the mantle. This results in features like volcanic island chains, such as seen in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, as well as the Philippine Islands, and the deep ocean trenches like the Marianas Trench, which is about two and a half times as deep as Mount Rainier is tall. At an ocean continent convergent boundary, because the continental crust is much less dense than the oceanic crust, it ends up riding on top of the oceanic crust that is being subducted beneath it. As the subducting oceanic crust warms and melts, the molten rock begins rising towards the Earth's surface, producing chains of volcanic mountain ranges on land. The Andes Mountains, the longest mountain chain in South America, is a great example of this, as well as the Cascade Range in the Pacific Northwest, stretching as far north as Canada and as far south as Mount Lassen is in California. Where two continental plates converge, because of the relatively equal densities of those plates, the degree to which one subducts under another one is much less apparent. The result is the edges of those continental plates both lifting up, forming a non-volcanic mountain range. The formation of the Himalayas, where the Indian subcontinent and the Eurasian plate meet, is a superb example of such a boundary. Within the divergent boundary category, there are two types of interactions. The first is an ocean-ocean divergent boundary. The longest mountain range on Earth, although underwater, includes the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Each half of the Atlantic Ocean is separated by this ridge that is slowly widening the Atlantic Ocean at a rate of about 2 to 5 centimeters per year. 
The second type of divergent boundary is one that exists between two continental plates. As they begin to separate, they initially form what's called a rift valley. Over time, and as the rift grows in size, water slowly begins to fill in, forming an increasingly larger sea. This satellite image shows some of the bodies of water that are found in Africa's rift valley as the Nubian plate on the left slides away from the Somalian plate on the right. Let's now watch a short video from National Geographic that will explore this region of Earth a little more closely. What geologists expect to form, at least 50 million years from now, is a separate, smaller continent off of Africa's east coast. At a transform boundary, the most common features observed there are fault lines. One of the most famous examples of such is the San Andreas Fault that runs north-south through most of California. This map illustrates the path the fault line takes, with the Pacific plate to the left of the red line and the North American plate to the right of it. The movement of these two plates is such that the Pacific plate, where Los Angeles is located, is moving up mostly in a northerly direction, and the North American plate, where San Francisco sits, is moving in a mostly southern direction. Because of the movement of those two plates along that boundary, Los Angeles and San Francisco are ever so slowly moving closer together. Although most often associated with transform boundaries, earthquakes are geologic phenomena that can occur along any type of plate boundary. Tectonic plates can end up locking together for a period of time due to friction. This causes a buildup of physical stress that will eventually be released, resulting in an earthquake. Earthquakes have the potential to cause great damage and loss of life depending upon their strength, how deep the hypocenter is, and where on Earth they occur. We measure the effects of an earthquake both objectively and subjectively. The objective measure allows us to quantify how much energy is released by the earthquake, and the scale used is the moment magnitude scale. The moment magnitude scale is logarithmic, meaning that a magnitude 2 earthquake has 10 times the amplitude of a magnitude 1 earthquake. The modified Mercalli scale is a subjective way of describing the effects of an earthquake and how it felt to the people who experienced it. When earthquakes occur on the ocean floor, the displacement of large volumes of water can trigger tsunami. 
far from the dramatic skyscraper high waves shown in movies, real tsunami aren't necessarily any less dangerous. In the open ocean, they travel as quickly as 800 kilometers per hour, but slow down to 30 to 50 kilometers per hour as they reach land, bringing massive volumes of water, traveling far inland in low-lying areas, and leaving a devastating path of destruction. But not all of the exciting, amazing geologic activity occurs at plate boundaries. Not yet completely understood by geologists, a hot spot is a stationary area in the mantle that is unusually hot, bringing liquid magma close to the crust. Although the hot spot itself doesn't move, the tectonic plate above it does. The result is geologic activity that seems to move position over time. This map illustrates a number of well-known hotspots around the globe. One most famous well-known example is found in the Hawaiian Islands. The southeasternmost island of Hawaii is geologically active since it's sitting directly over a hotspot, but traveling west and to the north, we observe a nearly 1,100 kilometer long chain of underwater mountains that were formed as the Pacific plate moved over the stationary hotspot. Another really great example and really cool national park to visit is found in Yellowstone. The Yellowstone caldera, which currently sits in the northwestern corner of Wyoming, is the largest supervolcano on Earth and is the result of a hotspot directly beneath it. But about 16 million years ago, the portion of the North American plate that was over the hotspot is where the northwestern corner of modern-day Nevada is. In the last few million years, the Yellowstone caldera has experienced the most massive forms of its eruptions every 600 to 800,000 years, most recently 630,000 years ago. And on that note, that brings topic 4.1 to a close. Thanks for watching. Take care.